In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one and Amin, welcome back. This is the second time we are speaking about the Epistle of St. Paul to the Romans. Last week, we gave a very, very brief introduction to the life of St. Paul. And we said that he was born with the name of Saul, and he was educated, the best education, education there was in the day. There was the Greek philosophy, and then he went to Jerusalem to study the, the law under a very great uh, law teacher. And his name was Gamaliel. Okay. And we saw his conversion from Judaism to Christianity. We saw how the Lord prepared everything. And on his way to Damascus, St. Paul saw a vision of Christ. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And we saw how the Lord prepared the man in Damascus to go and visit St. Paul and baptize him. And then we saw how St. Paul spent three years after his baptism studying the scripture, revisiting the scripture in the light of Christianity to see the prophecies being fulfilled in the person of Christ. And then after this, he went to Antioch, where he started to serve there. And from Antioch, he went all over Europe and Asia on three missionary journeys. The first journey, he didn't write any letters. The second journey, he wrote two letters, first and second, Thessalonians. And then on the third journey, he wrote four letters. Four letters, first and second Corinthians, Galatians, and the epistle we're studying, Romans. After this, he went back to Jerusalem, where he was arrested and shipped to Rome. And in Rome, he spends two years in jail, and he writes four letters. Philippians, Ephesians, Philemon, and Colossians. After this, he goes, he actually gets out of jail by a miracle, and he writes three more letters. First Timothy, Titus, and Hebrews. Right after this, he's arrested again, and this is it for him. He's about to be martyred. So he writes a letter, the farewell epistle, to his disciple Timothy, the second letter to Timothy, and he tells him, come quickly, I am about to be martyred. And this is it, the life of St. Paul, basically, very, very quickly. St. Paul and St. Peter are martyred together in Rome. St. Paul is martyred with the sword because he has a Roman citizenship. So it's an un honorable death. And St. Peter, because he doesn't, he is martyred by crucifixion. But he doesn't want to be crucified like Christ, so he asks that he is crucified upside down, so they crucify him upside down. And this is how he is martyred. Now basically, the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans contains everything, all the theology that St. Paul knows and learned about Christianity, about Christ, about what it means to be a Christian, about what salvation is, what it means to both Jews and Gentiles. He wrote this letter to them, to the Romans, the church in Rome, because there was a division among them. There was a group of Christians from a Jewish background and a group of Christians from a Gentile background. So, so to reconcile them and to explain to them the true meaning of Christianity, he writes this letter. He writes this letter. So today, we'll start. We'll see how far we can get today. We'll uh, begin uh, by reading a few verses. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one Lord, I mean. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith, among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. St. Paul begins, as usual, as any letter would, with an introduction. From who? From Paul. From Paul, and this is to authenticate the letter. Let's say the letter, uh, this is truly from St. Paul. He does this with all the epistles that we have in the Bible, except for the epistle to 
the Hebrews, the epistle to the Hebrews. And the church, the Coptic Orthodox Church, has always been saying that, and when we read it in the liturgy, we always read the epistle of St. Paul to the Hebrews during the Pauline epistles. So it's always been testified by the church that the Pauline epistles um, is also including the Hebrew, the epistle to the Hebrews. So he wrote this epistle beginning with a greeting from Paul. And how does he identify himself? He says, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Now why would St. Paul call himself a bond servant? A bond servant essentially a servant or a slave. Why would he do this? This is St. Paul. This is the one whom Christ appeared to many times. Why would he call himself a bond servant? Especially after Christ, John 15:15, 15, 15, he declares very, very clearly, he says, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. And again, Christ tells us, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. You shall be free indeed. And God doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say, you are friends, but you are sons. He gives us this gift of sonship, this gift of adoption. He adopted us through Jesus Christ. And it was St. Paul in Ephesians 1.5 who wrote this. He says, having predestined us, to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. So with St. Paul who wrote this, he says we are adopted, and still he calls himself a bond servant. He calls himself a bond servant. Why would he do this? Why would he return himself to a lesser state, from a son to a servant or a slave? Being adopted doesn't cancel out the fact that we're still slaves. We're still His servants. The way God looks at us, He sees sons and daughters. He looks at us as children. But how should we look at Him? Sometimes we look at Him as, yes, He's our Father, and we act as spoiled children. But we should look at Him in the true way. We see how St. Mary looked at Him. How did St. Mary look at at God, she says, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. The angel appears to her and says, You are going to be the mother of the highest, the mother of the Son of God. And what does she reply and say? Behold the maidservant of the Lord. In the Old Testament, if in the Old Testament, there was something called the year of the Jubilee. And during that year, everything is restored. Land is restored to its rightful owners, just in case their owners fell in hard times. And they would sell the land. Every 50 years, everything is restored. Like pushing the reset button on the computer. Everything returns to normal. Including slaves, people who sell themselves, or their children, or their family members, because they need the money. Every 50 years, they are restored. They are set free. Okay? And it is in Leviticus 25 that we see the law concerning the year of the Jubilee and slavery. If one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave. As a hired servant and a sojourner he shall be with you and you shall serve, he shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. And that was every 50 years. Okay? In Exodus 21, concerning by this restoration, they would tell the, the, the slave or the servant, you're free, it's the year of the Jubilee. But if the servant refuses, we see here, if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go free, then his master shall bring him to the judges, he shall also bring him to the door, or to the doorpost, to the gate of the city, and his master shall pierce his ear with an owl, and he shall serve him for ever. Shall serve him for ever. God sees us, God is our master, and he sees us as children, but that doesn't take away the fact that we are his servants, and we should see him as 
our master. When uh, the prodigal son realizes, comes back, returns to himself and says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servant. What did the father say? Did he say, okay, I will allow you to return to my house as a hired servant? Or did he restore him to the level of sonship? He said to him, this, is, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is and is found. The, the woman that was bleeding for 12 years, the woman that was sick for 12 years, she came and she said, I will touch, all I need was to touch the hem of his garment. If only I may touch his garments, I shall be made well. She, if she was thinking of herself, I am, I am a daughter, I'm not a slave. She said, I need at least to hug him or for him to embrace me and hug me. No, she said, as a servant, all I need was just touch the hem of his garment. And he, Christ, looks at her and says, Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. He restored her again to this level, to this higher level of a relationship. David in the Psalm, Psalm 123 verse 2. It says, Behold as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God until He has mercy on us. This should be our attitude towards God. When we look at Him, this is what we see. Instead, <coughs> instead, St. Paul explains to us very well how God sees us. He says in Galatians 4, Galatians 4.4, 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. This is how God sees us, as sons and daughters. We still need to see Him as our Master. We can serve God as servants on two levels. Believers and non-believers alike, all of us, every single human being serves God on a physical level. On a physical level. On a physical level we see this world full of physical laws, like the law of gravity. It doesn't matter if someone doesn't believe in gravity, if they jump off the CN Tower, they will. They're, they will fall. They're still subject to that law. And this we share with everyone else. Everyone else submits to these laws. Submits to these laws. But true sons of God obey Him on a spiritual level. The spiritual laws that He offers us. And He says, obey me. Blessed are those who hear and do the words that I say. If we obey Him on a spiritual level, this is the level that our Lord wants. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they are and they follow me. And again he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I am known by them. So Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, seems very simple. But in declaring that he's a servant of Jesus Christ, what is he saying? He's a servant of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of God. Well, either he is God and he's serving him, or St. Paul declares that he's serving someone else, someone who is not God. And this is not true. So he declares in this very small statement that Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is God. The name Jesus, where did he get this from? Where did he get the name Jesus from? When the angel appeared to St. Mary, he told her, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Luke 131. The word Jesus means Savior. Savior, right? And the whole Old Testament is testifying and prophesying to this Savior, to the coming of this Savior. Isaiah 43, I even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. And in Matthew 121, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. 
And finally, in Acts 4, 12, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is the only name, this is the only name that could save us, the name of Jesus. And that's why in the Orthodox Church here we have a practice, a prayer practice called the Jesus Prayer, the Jesus Prayer. The Jesus Prayer, the name Jesus is very powerful. And we have the Jesus Prayer in the church. But this is not the only name. The name Emmanuel. Emmanuel was also given in Matthew 1.23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Matthew 1.23. So this is the word Jesus, the name Jesus. How about the name Christ? Jesus Christ. Christ comes from the Greek word Christo. And this means covered in oil. It means covered in oil. It's a literal translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. And Messiah is the Anointed One. Messiah is the Anointed One. Back in the Old Testament, they used to anoint three kinds of people. Priests, prophets, and kings. Priests, prophets, and kings. And these Anointed Ones, as soon as they become anointed, they become under the, uh, the direct protection of God. In 1 Chronicles 16, the Lord says, Do not touch my anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. But Christ is not just an anointed one, He is the anointed one. The one who is to come and save His people. So therefore, the name Jesus Christ refers to both His divinity and His humanity. This is the Messiah we've been waiting for. This is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. In the first, first church, the first creed, the very first creed, the Orthodox creed we have today, came in the fourth century. But the very first creed was just a few words, testifying our faith. Jesus Christ, Son of God, our Savior. And in Greek, it was Eius Iso Christu, Eius Theos Sotir. Jesus Christ, Son of God, our Savior. And the first letter of each of these words in Greek, put together, it meant the word fish. And that was why fish was a symbol of Christianity and still is. Say that again. How did they get fish? Iso Christu, Eius Theos Sotir. Okay. Exeus in Greek means fish. So, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. In these few words, he testifies, he proclaims his faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Son of the living God. Called to be an apostle. Called to be an apostle. For example, when a couple has a child, has a baby, they call his name so and so. Is this the same kind of calling from now on? Instead of calling you Paul, we're going to call you Apostle. Is that how he was called? Not like that. Calling, the calling that he meant was a calling from God. He was called from God to become or to be an Apostle. And he was called by God in a very unique way, this man. No one else has been called by God in the same way. We see how the Son, how Jesus Christ Himself calls him on His way to Damascus. And says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? We see how the Holy Spirit calls him. The Holy Spirit said in Acts 13, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And again we see how God the Father calls him. In Galatians 1, 15 through 16, he says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me through His grace, to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the Gentiles. That I might preach Him among the Gentiles. So, so this man was called in a very unique way. But just because God called him, did God call him out of favoritism or partiality? I mean, if God called certain people, only certain people will be able to go to heaven based on who God calls, this would not be right. But God called him 
not for salvation, but for, for service. God called them for service. And just because God called them for service, it doesn't mean that his sal salvation is guaranteed. It doesn't mean that salvation is guaranteed. When he's speaking in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 about the gifts and the ministries and the gifts that God give, gives for the sake of the service, he says the Spirit, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. But he himself knows that if he is not faithful in his service, he can become disqualified, like in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. He says, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself become disqualified. So he knows this. And just because someone is called to some sort of service in the church, doesn't mean they have a free ticket to heaven. If still they are not faithful, their salvation is in jeopardy. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Now, St. Paul's calling implies a separation. A separation, a dedication, or a consecration. A consecration. You cannot do the service of God and any other service. God called him, said, leave everything and come follow me. Leave all of your work and come and be my disciple. Come follow me. So as a Pharisee, he was a Pharisee before, he was separated, separated to the, to the study of the law. And where did this take him? Where did this bring him? This literally separated him from the people. The people who were supposed to serve through the law, it separated, put a, a barrier between him and the people. And when Christ came, he said, in Matthew 23, but all their works they do, they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They used to have these kind of bandanas they, they put on their forehead and on their arm with verses on them, the scripture on them, so they make them big and wide so people can see them. And the, the hem of their garments, they used to make them very broad and they hang bells on them, little small bells. So when they're walking in the street, the people can hear and run away, oh, there's a Pharisee coming. Don't come near him, don't touch him. He's a Pharisee. Not a bad thing, but because they did not want them to come in touch with anything unclean. So in essence, this separation did not do its intended uh, purpose. Separated to what? To the Gospel of God. To the Gospel of God. In another place in the Bible, we see, we see it called not the Gospel of God, but the Gospel of Jesus Christ. At the beginning of the Gospel, according to St. Mark, Mark 1.1. 1, 1. It says, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. See, the Gospel of, of Jesus Christ or the Gospel of God is interchangeable because Jesus Christ is God. And God is Jesus Christ, All right? But in this verse, the word God refers to God the Father. God the Father, separated to the Gospel of God, which He promised before through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning His Son Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is also to indicate what? That there is a unity. A unity in the essence between the Father and the Son. Since we use the words interchangeably between the Gospel of God and the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we say that the Gospel of God concerning His Son. So we see the unity between the Father and the Son. Which He promised before through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So the Holy Scriptures are a reference to the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not done, is not done with, and we don't throw it away. We don't do that. The Old Testament, the Old Testament is very important to the New Testament. See, the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament in the New Testament gives us many benefits. When we see how God says what He's going to do in the Old Testament, and we see the fulfillment of these prophecies in the New Testament, what does, it, does this make us do? or feel towards God, a certain level of trust. We see that God is faithful. We see Him 
saying things that are so impossible, so unbelievable, how a virgin is going to become pregnant and give, bring forth a son. And that's the way exactly it happens. We see how he is going to be, how he is going to be crucified. And he does it the exact same way. In Isaiah 53, in Isaiah 53 verse 9, And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Nor was there any deceit in his mouth. So these things are what Christ refers to them as being fulfilled. The fulfillment of the Old Testament in the person of Christ. These things are a shadow. A shadow and the substance belongs to Christ. So because these things are a shadow, we don't fulfill them, we don't follow them anymore. Like all the blood sacrifices of the Old Testament, these were all to symbolize the true sacrifice, Jesus Christ. So we don't offer blood sacrifices anymore on the altar. We just have the one sacrifice, the body and blood of Christ. Things that have to do with the way God wants us to live. Like for example, we look at the Ten Commandments. And we look at the Ten Commandments, the last six. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. All these things we still follow. We don't say, oh, these things are Old Testament and it's okay to commit adultery. It's okay to dishonor your father and your mother. We don't do that. Because these things have to do with the way God wanted us and still wants us to live. So he says, which he promised. So the Gospel, the Old Testament, the Old Testament is basically a promise. It's full of prophecies, yes. But these prophecies in themselves are a promise. A promise God made to people who lived a long time ago. And we saw how these prophecies came true. So this adds to the faithfulness of God. This makes us believe that what God says, He is faithful to do and to fulfill. So now when He comes and tells us, do not fear. When He comes and tells us, do not worry. This gives us the courage to believe, yes, God said this and He is faithful. Therefore, He's going to fulfill this. He's going to take care of this. God is going to keep His covenant. When St. Uh, John, when, uh, John the Baptist was imprisoned, he sent two of his disciples to Christ, asking him, are you the Messiah or should we wait for another? So Jesus told them, go and tell John the Baptist what you see. The, Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The, deaf, uh, the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. But we look back at Isaiah 35, we see the exact same prophecy almost word for word. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb sh shall sing. For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. So we see how God fulfills them. And this makes us trust Him even more and more. So that the faithfulness of God is established. It makes us, it makes us trust Him. Now, verse 3. Concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Concerning his son, he calls Jesus Christ his son. This is to affirm that they are of one, of one, not only one nature, but of one essence. Of one essence. An apple comes from an apple tree, an orange from an orange tree. So at least Jesus Christ is of the same nature, but is he of the same essence as God? And how did God have a son? All these questions he indirectly answers with this one verse. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So how did this happen? First John 4, 9. In this the love of God was manifested toward us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. His only begotten son. Okay, that makes it, does that answer our question? How Jesus Christ came to be? 
No, not yet. Begotten. What does the word begotten mean? We look in the Old Testament, we look in the Old Testament, and we see many, many places where we see genealogies. And this person begat such and such, and so on. First of all, we see begotten. It's different tense. Yes. If it's in the past, why is, it, why is it not begat? Why is it not the father begat the son? Why is it begotten? Because it's a continuous process. When did this happen? Well, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And again in Colossians 1, he says, For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. In the Orthodox Creed, we say, Begotten of the Father before all ages. Light of light, true God of true God. Begotten, not created of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made. So when did this happen? Before all ages. Before all ages. This came, this came at a point in time, there was a man named Arius. And he said that the Father existed before the Son. There was a time that the Father existed and the Son didn't. And the Son is created. So Saint Athanasius said to him, how could this be? The Son is created before all ages. There was never a time when the Father was there and the Son wasn't. And if the Father was there and did not have a Son, how can He be called Father? How can He be called Father? So the Son, we understand, He was begotten before all ages. Begotten how? We don't know. He was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Begotten, and then now He's saying He's born of the seed of David according to the flesh. As according to the divinity, He's begotten of the Father before all ages. But according to the humanity, He is the Son of David. He is the Son of David. The incarnation of the Word, the incarnation of the Son of God is not a starting point for the Son of God, but it is the beginning of the incarnation, the beginning of when the Son of God walked this earth, walked this earth and took flesh and became man. But does it mean that He did not exist before? This also does not mean that in order to gain humanity, he had to give up his divinity. His humanity and his divinity became united and then again never ever separating. It was a hypostatic union between the humanity and the divinity containing all, all the properties of divinity and all the properties of a humanity. So according to the flesh he was the son of David and according to the divinity he was the son of God. Verse 4, declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Declared to be the son of God, declared. Declared means kind of like an announcement when you declare something, when you announce it to the world. Like when he was baptized in the Jordan. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice from heaven came saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. At this moment, at this moment, did Jesus Christ become the beloved Son? Or was it just a declaration? It was a declaration to all the world that this is the Son of? The Son of God, exactly. Declared to be the Son of God with power. How? By the resurrection of the dead. By the resurrection of the dead. See, all the miracles that Jesus did, all the miracles that Jesus did, were nothing compares in with the resurrection. Healing the sick, raising the dead, commanding nature. Walking on water, rebuking the wind and all of that. Nothing, nothing compared to the power of raising himself from the dead. And this is a declaration of his divinity. According to the spirit of holiness. What does that mean? According to the spirit of holiness. 
He had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. According to the spirit of holiness, the Messiah, this is from Isaiah 53. It says, no deceit is found in his mouth. So according to the spirit of holiness, this is what it's going to declare to us who the Messiah is. Someone who is sinless, someone who has no deceit in his mouth. And then in John 8, 46, Christ himself says what? Which of you convicts me of sin? So he declares very openly, it is me, I am the Messiah. I am the one who is without sin. Verse 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Through him and for his name. Through him and for his name. We find out that everything we have, everything is a gift. Is a gift that we received from God through him and for his name. Through him and for his name. <clears throat> Saint James Yolena, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, comes down from the Father of, of lights. So this is through him and for his name. And therefore, whether you eat or drink and whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory of God. So everything we receive, we receive from God. And why do we receive it? For the glory of God, not our own personal glory. Through him and for his name, we have received grace and apostleship. Grace, the definition of grace is that it is a free gift that is undeserved. We do, not, we do not deserve it, we cannot possibly afford it, but it's given to us freely. Why is it given? Oh, for the sake of the apostleship. When God gives a responsibility, He always gives the grace, the abilities to be able to fill this responsibility. Otherwise, it will be like the disciples, five loaves and two fish. And what if God did not bless the five loaves and two fish? Would they have been able to feed the 5,000? Never. So it is God that provides the responsibility, but also the grace for us to be able to fill this responsibility. What was the grace that was given to St. Paul? Basically, the will of God being manifested in his life. We see from day one, from the time he was born, God is shaping him, preparing him for this ministry, for this service. Whether in terms of education, in terms of citizenship, in terms of zeal towards the church or against it at the beginning. All of this stuff was the grace that was given to prepare him for his ministry. And the apostleship. Was he a disciple of Christ? Was he one of the 12 disciples? Was he one of the 70 apostles? So what apostleship did he receive and from whom? He tells us in 2 Corinthians 12, lest I should be exalted above measure by abundance of the revelations. A thorn in the flesh was given to me. The abundance of the revelations. Jesus himself appeared to him, appeared to him and gave him this apostleship. He taught him. He taught him. Everything he knew about, about Christianity, he learned directly from Jesus Christ. Apostleship and grace. For what? For the obedience to the faith. Obedience to the faith. That was the aim of this apostleship. What does the faith say? The faith declares to us the truth. There is a God. Jesus Christ is God. Believe in Him. So this is the faith. The truth, whether we believe in it or not, is, is the truth. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. 1 Corinthians 2.12 And all this, the truth that God declares to us, the truth that God declares to us, He tells us, Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. See, some people are offended by God. They don't like God. They don't like to hear about God. Or at least God as He truly is. They like a custom made God. A God that fits into their life. A God that fits into their pocket and they can take Him out whenever they please and then put Him in whenever they please. So He says to them, Blessed is He who is not offended because of Me. 
for the obedience of, to the faith among all nations. This is why the Lord chose St. Paul to preach to all nations. First, he tells him in Acts 9, Go, he tells Ananias, the man who baptized him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings and children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And again in Acts 22, he says, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And then finally he appears to him again and gives him very direct, very specific mission. He says, then be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness, where? At Rome. And this was the heart of the Gentiles, the heart of the Roman Empire, Rome. Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. See, just as God called the Jews, He also called the Gentiles. Just as He called the Jews, He called the Gentiles. Even so the, the Gentiles do not feel like they are rejected by God. He sent them, He sent them just for them, an apostle. St. Paul. And then finally, he gets to the end of the introduction. He says to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. He began with Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. And then it should have ended to, from Paul, to the church in Rome. But he started to speak about his apostleship, or where they receive it, or from, from Jesus Christ, and he couldn't stop with Jesus Christ. He entered into a whole description about Jesus Christ, who he was, who he is, where did he come from, how he is God, how his humanity, his divinity, and all of that. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, beloved of God. He calls them beloved of God. He calls these Gentiles beloved of God. We love Him because He loved us first. We love Him because He loved us first. Beloved of God, and how nice it must have been for them to hear these words. All the way in Rome, no disciple dares to go visit them because of the heavy, heavy persecution. All the people there are heavily persecuted to begin with. And then St. Paul sends them a letter saying, you are the beloved of God. God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, chapter, verse 8. While we were still sinners, He did not wait till we got a little bit better or improved slightly. No, while we were still deep in sin, He sent His only begotten Son to save us. Called to be saints. These Gentiles are called to be saints. Yes, they are called to be saints. The calling to become a saint is not exclusive. It's inclusive. It includes everyone. Everyone. Matthew 5.48 Be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And again, St. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 As He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So a call to holiness, a call to being a saint, to be perfect, to be complete, is for everyone. It's not just for a few, a select few. Oh, they are saints. They're good people. They're going to be saints. No, no, it's for all of us. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the first gifts that we always get from God before anything else. Grace and peace. But the peace we get from God is different. We get peace from the world, but the peace of the world is very, very conditional. If we violate the terms of these conditions, the peace goes away. He says to us, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The peace that we get from God, the peace that we get from God, no one can touch it. No one can touch it. We only lose it if we give it up. We only lose it if we give it up. The peace of the world is very conditional. 
It depends. It's very, it depends on many factors. But the peace of God does not depend on any circumstances. To Him be the glory forever and ever. Amen.